that's also through Camtasia. Um, I just got the uh, link to the book chapter. If you're interested in reviewing one or more of the sessions, you're invited to do that, and then you can write a chapter for Connecting Online for CO1 for book. All right, and I'll share the link with you in a moment. I see Andrew's here and um, apologizing. Um, I'm fine with things like that. Um, so I hope everybody else is too. Uh, let me just uh, pass on the uh, tools to Andrew so he can get started. Andrew also added the uh, YouTube video that I kept listening to today. I found it um, very, very useful. Okay, so let me just uh, get Andrew here. There's also a desktop. I see that some of you, um, I think Valentina is using the WizIQ desktop. I can see it here. I hope you're going to have a wonderful experience with it. Um, the WizIQ desktop is a lot faster and takes less bandwidth. Hello, Andrew, and welcome. Good to see you all the way from Australia. We, we got to the airport yesterday. You know, I was telling everybody, now we're on a tour to Australia. So we got to the airport, but we didn't go through customs. For some reason, they wouldn't let us in. So I'm glad we're in Australia now um, and ready to go. Uh, here's your presentation. Let me just get that up. Oh, it's kind of distance. Wombat. <laughs> um, let me see if I can get. Is everybody hearing well? Um, I know they tested your system, but it seems kind of low for me. Uh, give me a thumbs up if uh, sound is okay for you from Andrew's end. I know that I'm loud, but that's me. I'm generally um, a loud speaker. Andrew, can you try again, please? Yes, I'm oh. here loud and clear. Yes, you are loud and clear when you're close to the mic. Yes, that's true. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. I'm, I'm really excited about this session because uh, there's so much to learn from Andrew. I hope you realize that, Andrew. So. Let's get going. Thank you. <laughs> That's not much time. So, hi everyone. Yeah, I'm really truly sorry about yesterday, but I have no idea what happened in my diary. I don't know. Anyway, I'll, I'm going there. <laughs> One of those things. First time it's happened to me. Hopefully, the last. Anyway, here I am, and I'm very happy to be on board and um, talking to you about the topic which is actually quite close to my heart. Um, Basically, because I think this really is at the heart of, of learning languages. In fact, it's in, it's in fact the heart of learning anything, truth be known. Um, unless you want to actually just memorize something or, or, or do some very sort of bland kind of learning. Um, you can't hear. Well, that's no good. Is that, now it's better? It's still a bit low. Well, we tested this, this microphone before and it seems to be coming up much better. Better now, somebody says. Closer to the mic. Can't get any closer than this because my mouth will be next thing you'll be doing is eating the mic. How's that? Okay. I love the mic in front of my mouth, a bit like they do in the movies. Okay. So um, let's get started because time is uh, pressing. And um, so, how I'll start off basically um, just talk a little bit about why um, the introduction to this um, topic. Um, so, what's happened is that I think for too long language teachers have been far too concerned with teaching grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation and ignoring other factors that are sometimes much more important in determining success. The result has been that most learners have had a struggle to learn languages and English to, to wit. Did you know that in research undertaking in a variety of countries, the average rate for successfully learning a foreign language is on average 5%. This is despite the fact that we have all proven that we have what it takes to learn languages by learning the hardest languages of them all our first. There must be some fine tuning done if we are to actually help our students rediscover the incomparable powers 
we all developed in our first few years on the planet. There are many ways to come at this, but at the heart of it all, at the heart of it all, I believe we can best understand what infants do by coming to it through the perspective of engagement. We can't follow it. I'm, am I going too fast? That's the problem. So engagement is critical. So what does engage mean? Um, so let's go to the other slide. Here we go. So here is one definition of, of engage. And what it engage here, what he says is that Engage, this comes from dictionary, is to make an effort to understand and deal with someone or something. So it's a deal that separates this this word from just the word like interest. Interest is very uh, bland, really, um, and so engage is far more uh, involving, and that's why it's important that learners need to actually initiate their learning and not be dragged into it. We need to realise that no one else can make the effort for us as a learner. We have to do it by ourselves. For too long, we've been had the belief that we can make it easy for learners by parceling up the content into easy to digest pieces without thought of a learning perspective. Learners are somehow meant to learn it or memorise what we tell them, but in fact, this doesn't really work for most learners. No matter what we are told or how we are coerced, coerced, at the heart of it, really, engagement energy that we instigate from ourselves. So it has to come from us, from within. It may be as a result of something we experienced, we thought, saw, whatever it is, it's very personal. A deaf student has learned to play the game of being a student, can feign that the real thing is needed for real learning to happen. Engagement starts with interest but is a lot more than that. Interest can be passive, engagement cannot. It requires the full active involvement of the learner. The sooner we learn to understand that, the further we will, we will go. So our focus needs to be, is how do we in fact get our students involved? What do we as a teacher need to do to have our students get involved? So this is what, what this presentation actually is all going to be about. Um, explaining a little bit more about engagement and what it is we can do to help students engage. So let's move to the next slide. So the first thing to realise is that we all learned our first language. It was not a download. I don't know if you've seen The Matrix, but he learned karate in like two minutes and became like a black master, karate expert. This is not how language learning works. It is something, in fact, we took years to master. We took so long because we started with no language skills or any other skills for that matter to speak of. We learned our first language by perception, by sound, sound by sound, word by word, and utterance by utterance. There was no magic in any of this. Some parents do get active in trying to teach their students, but re their kids, but really the teaching they do is minimal active teaching compared to what the kid has to learn, learn the millions of things to become proficient in any language. So how do we learn our mother tongue? And I think this is an, a key part because once we understand this better, we can actually get a much better understanding of what we need to our students learn, not just memorise. So um, I don't want to go into it in a great deal of depth, but I will say a few things about it. So the first thing is that all of you who've been around kids uh, will have seen that children are very attentive to everything that goes on around them. They pay full attention to whatever they're involved in. So as they are very attentive, they can do many different things. So one thing, I'll, I've got a, some grandchildren now, one thing that we noticed the other day with um, Jonah was that uh, my son put the light on with his with his foot. It's one of those switches you have on the floor. And and the Jonah recognised that the light had gone on. He looked up, saw the light had gone on, and then Jason turned the switch off. And in the moment, he'd recognised that the, there was a light and the switch. And within the next, like, 10 seconds, he crawled over to the switch and started playing with the switch. So this is the quality of attention that all of us have. 
that we don't necessarily utilize because we're too concerned a lot of the time, or students are too concerned a lot of the time with um, trying to, to memorize something or try to learn something in a very sort of regimented way. And this gets in the way of their fundamental powers of learning, which is basically seeing something, understanding the connection between something, and making a move from there. So this um, is a key to it. And I don't know what you've seen in your classes, um, but I've seen that a lot of students um, don't really work like this. They're trying to understand the teacher. They're trying to learn something. They're trying to translate something. They're trying to do something that they believe will help their learning. Sometimes the teach, we as teachers help them, or sort of actually, actually not to help them, but we actually prevent them by giving them exercises which don't really exercise their attention, their engagement. It, it's more down pat. Oh, that's good. That sounds better. So um, what the baby needs to do, um, what the baby does in fact, fact is that they learn from what they do. They learn from what they hear. They learn from what they see. They don't get frustrated. They can learn multiple things at the same time, moving from one learning to another. They keep working on, uh, with their learning until their awareness tells them that there's nothing more to do. And it's their awareness that tells them. It's not the mother saying, oh, this is good enough. Yeah, no, you can stop learning this. The child becomes aware that my sound, that my speech is as good as my mum's, my friend's, that's good enough. Okay, so the fading away is not to do with me because my mouth hasn't moved from the microphone. Okay, so that's what we have. So what we have, and all of us have this, we have amazing listening and noticing hours. And that's the, the, the key that we need, I believe, uh, that we need to encourage within our, within our learners. They, um, they need to be basically watching what, uh, as learners, learners need to be watching what's going on and not be thinking and imagining, but to actually be attentive. And that attention comes from being engaged. If you're not engaged in something, you can't be attentive. And so a lot of the time, what, what can happen is that learners um, get distracted by something they don't really want to do, and babies do the same. They, they ask something they don't want to do, and they all, all, all of a sudden go off their, off their game, off their learning, and get upset. And learners are the same, adult learners are the same. The difference is that we learn as adults, or even as children, to control ourselves. So we can sit, so this is, um, so we can sit down listening to somebody trying to teach us, but if we're not involved and not engaged, our brain will be turning off and we won't be really following what's going on. We think we are, we zone in and out, but we're not really there. We're just sitting there looking like we understand. And this is what happens when the classes are teacher dominated. When the teacher de determines what he studied, when it is studied, how it is studied. In fact, every element of the class Attention is always on, as she says. As a result, the student focus on trying to figure out what the teacher said or wants, not what they want to learn, not what they have in their mind as, as, a, as a pressing need. So this is where the problems happen, uh, because we basically have, have learned, in a sense, to ignore the importance of engagement. And there are, in fact, other problems that happen as we go along, um, that as we grow up, there are changes, of course. And uh, these changes are not just what we're talking about engagement, but the changes that to do with our developing, um, our developing our priorities. Our priorities can change. We, have, we develop beliefs. Our beliefs can stop us. So, for example, if I believe I'm no good at learning English, or whatever language you're talking about, then of course that belief will stop you learning. And this has been shown in multiple tests. 
shyness can be a problem. Um, you know, if one doesn't feel comfortable in speaking, it's very difficult to learn a, another language because speaking is so fundamental to it. Being insecure, looking to others for reassurance or confirmation, which is unwilling to take responsibility for one's own learning. Uh, and this can happen with adults for different reasons. Poor listening skills can happen as our character develops. A heavily dominant intellect, with it where and some people you must know like that who think through everything, and I call this paralysis by analysis. Um, the mind is very important, of that, of that there's no doubt. But there's more to us as human beings than just our mind. So we have a lot more than our intellect is. And so and there are people who are overly emotional at times. So all of these issues can actually cause problems for us um, and keep us from, from actually um, keep us away from learning effectively. However, engagement is something that can help, in a sense, overcome all of that. Because once you're engaged, you're taken out of yourself. You feel you're sucked into it. You feel you're drawn into it. You feel that um, um, that you know you become powerful because you, you feel this is something that, that belongs to you that you can really get in, involved in. So engagement can help adults who have been disenfranchised or children to come back in touch with themselves, um, and that's, that's that's a really powerful thing, more than just learning languages. So, and that means that the, the student, you can see in this picture, is you have to be involved and engrossed in the class. So in my classes, a, um, a benchmark that I use is that if I don't have all my, all, and I mean all, A-double-L, all my students engrossed and engaged in the class, sometimes, of course, some students will waft in and waft out, you know, something happens in their mind, which is fine. But if they're wafting out, if they're leaving the class, in, in their, if they're leaving their mind, if they're leaving their, their, you know, if you can see their eyes elsewhere and they're not coming back for long periods of time, I hope that's better sound-wise, then you know there's a problem. Um, you know that something has to change. I know something has to change. And so I have that constantly in my mind when I'm working with either individuals or working with large, small old classes, enough to 30 or 40, that I need to be attentive to what is happening in my class and change what I do to keep everyone engaged and engrossed in what's going on. So that's that's the task that I have. So how to achieve this, of course, is a whole other thing which I'll come to very soon. Um, so a part of that. Um, how to get students engaged, and how to keep them engaged, is that um, it's to do with how much information we give them. And it's to do with the nature of language. The nature of language is that um, you can, it's a bit like, um, how can you say it? Um, if you give somebody some, some, for example, some bricks. From the bricks, you can make different kinds of constructions. So a few bricks can enable you to make different things. Language is the same. From a few basic elements in language, you can make up you know, literally thousand efficient. From a certain number of words, um, you can create an infinite number of expressions. They've talked about a few thousand, I think 8,000 words is basically the foundation of, of the language. And from that you can create an infinite number of variety of, of, um, of meanings. In fact, I've seen from even a few hundred, you can create you know, hundreds of thousands of things. So the, the issue is, is how to enable students to see that they can create. And language is a creative act. It's not a repetitive act. It's not a drilling act. It's a creative act. So in my classes, I want students to recognize that they can get back in touch with their creative side. And that's what is fundamentally important in, in learning, to learn, learning to speak a language. So I'll give you an example here, which is very basic, but um, it's a very good example, I believe. So here, here we go. So 
Oh, no, we go. So I'm going to look at the at the notion of number of numeracy. I can see your comments. Um, you're not quite good, Nicole. Wait. Oh, very good. So, um, do you need my numbers, help? Numbers. Well, a, so Andrew, do you here we have English. We have. Sorry, sorry. somebody's speaking. Yeah, That's it's Nelly. Hi. Do you, me. Let me know if you need my help for um, for the YouTube video, or if you're okay with that. That's all good. That's fine. Thanks, Nelly, for offering. I appreciate that. Okay. So. Well, let's look at the number of the the whole issue of numbering in English. So we have here obviously one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So these are ten items of language that a student really has to master to be able to count. Now, if we're not talking about children, I mean, I think every young I mean, infants. We're talking about people who've come as a second language. Everybody knows the notion of numbering. So the notion of numbering doesn't have to be taught, apart from very, 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 very few people. So this is something they have to learn. There's no doubt about that. And if you go a bit, if we go a little bit further, we can see that 11 is also a new, a new number, a new sound. 12 is, as is 13. Now, what happens with 14 is that already um, we have something here that that you can see that the four actually comes from the, the, the four we've already learned. Teen comes from 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 the teen. So something there already is is actually has happened that they can create themselves. Fifteen is one new bit of information comes through, which is the fifth. But they have the teen. Now from then on, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. So 16, 17, 18, 19 are all old information. Old means they already have it. We don't have to teach it. We don't have to say it. We don't have to even do anything with it, basically. They can create it. 20 is new. So having done that, have a guess or have a think about, I'll give you a few seconds or moments to, to think about. To count to 999, how many more bits of new information would we have to create? Give them. Ask the question again. To get to count 999, how many more bits of information would we have to give them? Which they couldn't create. So they can't create 11 from, from what they know. They can't create 12. But they can create 15. 100, 2, so you're getting an idea, 3 or 5, okay, I'll look at it in a minute, you're getting the idea that they can create that and um, you know, I had classes where I've got to 999,999 with a beginner class with no other language at all apart from the numbers virtually. So. They, and, they can and they create it. I only give them the very, very few basic um, words we're talking about here. So we've got 19, so we're up to 20. Now, 20, all these are known. The 30, you can see, the, the THIR, they already have. The T, they already have from 20. And then, so... So these are the new bits that we have to give them, as it were. And as somebody came to, the, there we go. Sorry. The only other bit of information they have to be given to to count 999 is 100. And sorry, one more is and. They need the and. A and D. So they get. So this is an explosion. Now, just consider that from 999 you need. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17. Now, 17 bits of language, 17 to count to 999, right? That's already pretty amazing. But just consider the explosion to get to, not to, get to 1 minus a million. Basically, by adding one more word, they have <laughs> a geometric explosion. Geometric. 
and so that's the that's the creative aspect of of language and i've seen students get so enthused when they see that they create they create it they don't repeat it they don't um you know memorize it they don't have to memorize repeat they have to understand these 17 bits and for somebody who already comes in their own language this is not a big ask the big ask is to get the one two three four and all that's happening but most people get that pretty fast so this is the kind of of, of explosion that language um, provides and this is as a teacher it's so i found so important to understand this in, in language because this enables students to exercise their intellect to exercise their senses to exercise their eyes and ears to enable them to get to so much from so little and that's one of the keys for me in engagement is as a teacher knowing what i need to provide and knowing what they can produce or they can create for themselves once i become clear about that and i'll step out of the way and i'll let them take over i let them do what they need to do and it means a little bit of of teacher input but the teacher input is more about helping them see the connections rather than telling them and that's that's the key without a doubt so this same what you've seen here applies right through language so this is why for me this is a very powerful example because it, it provides an insight into what we need to do as teachers and what we need to understand as teachers of language that the students are capable of creating so much from so little so once we understand that and then we we allow them and we encourage them to to do the creation they have a sense of empowerment they have a sense of fulfillment that they have done this they see the lights go on and that's the when you see a light go on in your learning and i'm sure all of you, all of you have helped all of you have seen this sometimes in your lives ah oh, i get that i understand that there's a, there's a burst of energy and when you have multiple bursts of energy like in this example you you feel better about yourself you start feeling ah oh, i can do this ah oh, i can learn a language ah oh, this is amazing so this is a really important slide and a really important understanding that once a language teacher understands this they can actually um, help start to transform their own teaching and start to transform their classes so the students um, start to getting more engaged more creative more switched on okay so hopefully that's um, given you an insight into one of the aspects of of um, what we can do as as teachers to help our learners get engaged so if it's it's key here to understand that the challenge that we provide can be too difficult if it's too difficult the students will find it frustrating and disempowering if it's too easy they'll find it boring and the learner will be engaged and motivated to try and solve what they've been given much of teaching that i've seen and i see basic texts and you know all kinds of situations is that the teacher spends a lot of time explaining things explanations take away from the students the ability to discover the ability to understand not understand but to discover and ability to see for themselves understanding in my i'm sorry expl explanation of the kind that we fall into basically disempowers students it takes away from them their ability to come to an understanding for themselves by using this and that is fundamental in learning a language that is how as a first language and that is how we're going to keep learning language to high levels because there's no one who can teach you at the high level you have to do it all yourself 
Um, okay, so let's keep going a little bit further. I can see that from them, some of the input from you that some of the technology may be playing up. I'm not sure where the problem lies, but maybe when there's a replay, um, um, a file you can download, it may be better quality. So the question is, can all language learning be like this? I, I believe that it certainly can be. Um, I, 30 plus years of my professional life, working at, at this kind of teaching and learning, and I've seen that, you know, at times I've had to work to try to get, get a better idea of what to do. I've gone to workshops and, and so forth and so on and tried a lot of things myself. But I've come to the conclusion that it's all possible. So, um, I'll give you another example. Um, I'm just aware of the time. Um, and I, I was going to give you a story um, that is a really great story about um, learning. I still will. I think, I think there's enough time. Um, one of the best stories that... Um, it's always an amazing teaching tool, in my opinion. They um, can help us in so many ways. Because they don't, they teach us from a different perspective, not from the intellect, but from something else. So I'll, I'll give you a, I'll tell you the story, one of my favorite stories, in fact. And this is the story of um, Professor Agassiz. I don't know how you quite pronounce that word. And the fish. I don't know if any of you have heard it, but um, it's a great story. So this is a story about a famous professor um, and a student of his. So one of his students um, goes up to this very famous professor and says, please, can I come and study with you? So the professor, the professor says, um, looks at him and, no, no, I'm too busy. So, so the guy, the student, pleads and pleads, and finally the professor agrees to it. And he sends him into a lab with a fish. So he says, um, go into the lab with this fish and look right down whatever you see, whatever you can understand from it. So the student, very keen and done a bit of biology work before, rushes into with the fish, has a look at it, and in 10 minutes he's, he's learned all there. He's done all learning. Do, isn't it fantastic? So... After 10 minutes, um, the professor, he waits and waits, and the professor doesn't come. The time drags on. He's waiting, waiting. Lunchtime draws on. Anyway, so finally he thought, oh, look, I'll have another look. So he goes back, he does, and now he decides to draw the fish. By drawing the fish, he actually sees some new features, the scales, the gills, the eyes, which before he hadn't seen so, so clearly. So he said, oh, this is fantastic. Anyway, the professor returns and he asks him. So I, I, the, the student, the professor has this disappointed look on his face. He says, you have not looked carefully enough. You have not seen the most conspicuous part. Spend some more time. Find some more features. Well, you can imagine the student, very, dis, very disconsolate, upset. He goes, looks and looks, spends some time and finds some more features. And he says, this, is, this, should, this must be okay, must be okay. So the professor returns, looks at it and sort of still not that happy. Still you've not found it. Go home and maybe tomorrow you'll pass my test. The student is completely distraught. Walks home, can't believe what's going on. Goes to bed, tosses and turns all night. And um, then he wakes up in the morning, and all of a sudden something comes in his mind. And he says, he comes in the morning, he says to the professor, professor did, you have, did you perhaps mean that the fish has symmetrical sides with paired organs? And the professor has then a smile on his face. So this is an awesome story that, you know, shows us how much we can learn from just using our eyes from just using our senses and the value of sleep. There's some, at so many levels, there are so many things to learn about, the, about learning in, from the story. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, so, um, 
Sounds to a problem, looks like, Alicia. Sorry to hear that. So let's go to the next slide. And here I'll give you another another little look at, at, um, at information and how we can organise it or what we can do to help our students. This is, again, I'm teaching English, and this is English spelling now. So I've organised this... Um, this um, table in a certain way. So I want you to look at the table and have a look and see what strikes you. What what can you see from this table? What is it telling you? Patterns and structures, yep. What, what patterns, what structures? Have a look. I mean, you know, what you should need to notice is quite a few things that there's there's a table, the table's got columns, and the columns and also got rows. And in the, in, the, in the each cell, there is a certain combination. Okay, so word families, phonics, phonetics, um, yep, all that. You need, you need to look further. So what I could do, I could, what we could do... <laughs> I could set you this little task, so come back in two hours and tell me what you found. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, you can come back tomorrow. Okay. Okay, letter A. Okay, Marina, Mariana. Okay, letter A is... Okay, what, is, what about the letter A? What do you see with it? Short on the left. Variations on the right, yep. Short sounds, yep. Two sounds. Mm. Only two sounds. Which sounds? Consonant art. Rules of reading the letter A. Okay. Somebody's getting rules of reading the letter A. Okay, so the, the letter A, you can see, has got... If you look down the left-hand column, it's got... The sounds are consistent with the letter A. And the letter A, I mean, this is, some of you, depending where you are, maybe variations, but um, the way I speak um, is the letter, the letter A on the left column is the sound that you can see, for example, in cab, the A. So whether it's cab or pack or rad or bag or mal or sam or dan or gas or mass or bass, or rat or mat, they're all the same. Okay, on, on the right hand side, you can see that this is not a. So there are variations there, right? So you can see that, for example, with mal, pal, and gal, there is one L. At Ball, go, ball. So all of a sudden, you know, the double L, the A double L, yeah, aha, there you go, tells you something. So this is a um, something that tells us about the letter A. In fact, in English, there are 10 different sounds that the letter A makes in English. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? 10. Crikey. But it's not all random. So you can see, for example, one down, there's, a, there's an empty, on the left-hand column, there's an empty row on the left-hand side. In fact, there is no R. So each of those um, rows gives a different cons consonant ending. put an R together in English, it will never make, or I should never say never, I guess, in English, but let's say 99.9% .9 of the time, it will not make an A sound. So ta, ka, pa, sa, ma, fa. Longer. So if you're American, it's tar, so you, you pronounce the R, but the, the, the sound is very similar to it. It's an R sound, long R. Where with the, when you add a W to it, all of a sudden it changes. So I won't get any further. I'll let you do the rest of it yourself. Um, so the issue really is, you can see from here, that um, students, you know, what, what I do with spelling is a little bit like, not exactly the same, um, but I help students start to see that they can make sense of spelling by starting to see the pattern. And English is a bit of a funny language, but in fact, 
once you start seeing patterns like this, there is a lot of consistency. There are very few words that are completely random. One of them, for example, is does, D-O-E-S. Sound is R, spelling O-E. Well, there's only one word in the English language that's got O-E sounding R. Um, so that's something that you know, we have to give them. You know, there's all sorted out. There is, no, there is no option with that. It's a bit like we're giving them one, two, three, four. But once they start to see the patterns here, we don't have to give them the rest. You know, we can, we can start to be selective about what we help them to see, and from that they can create. And we ask them to, I ask them to create, to see and to, to use their senses, to use their minds, to use their perception. And by using that, they can slowly master the sounds of spellings of language and also their pronunciations. So here's another example that I, I thought would be a good one to look at in a short time. Um, there is one other one that um, it's now quarter to ten. I'm just wondering if there's enough time. There, there's a short Andrew, video I've chosen here. Uh, we can extend. That, um, I wrote that in the chat. At, yes. Yes. As much okay. as you need. No All pressure. Right. So I'll, this video only goes for four minutes. So that's not a problem. It's, and I think we'll have a bit of time for feedback still and questions at the end. Um, so this video, um, gives, it's only four minutes long, I think four and a half minutes long. And it shows I'm teaching pronunciation to a Vietnamese girl. And I'd, I'd like you to look at it. And um, again, with the mind, with the perception of what I've been talking about here, is how do I get the student engaged? And are they engaged? And what, what do I provide? What don't I provide? What does she do? What doesn't she do? Look at these questions to see as an example of how to get a student engaged um, in, in, in learning pronunciation, to improving their pronunciation. Vietnamese speakers are probably one of the most challenged um, languages to come to English because they have no consonant endings in words and they have no consonant blends at all so it creates for them and it's also a tonal language but the tonal many languages are tonal but these consonant endings and consonant blends creates significant issue master anyway without saying anything more let's see if this thing works or nelly can fire up the video okay here we go dun 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 dun, dun. Hi there. I recently spent some time working with a Vietnamese speaker to help her with the pronunciation. For those of you who don't know, Vietnamese doesn't have constant endings in words and certainly no consonant blends. So in this, they have their work cut out for them. This short video clip will show me working with her getting her to focus on what she's doing. The interesting thing to note is that she actually fixes this problem without me modeling for her once, without her listening to what she, the sounds should sound, actually sound like. The reality is that she has all she needs to fix this problem. All she is missing here is an awareness of what she's actually saying and not saying. All I do is to provide the necessary input for her to come to these awarenesses. She could have done this by herself, but for one reason or the other, she hasn't. This video clip gives many insights into the process of improving one's pronunciation. Every language learner goes through a very similar process themselves in improving their own pronunciation of a second language. The language learners that end up having great pronunciation are the ones that keep going through this process time and time again, using their own awareness to drive their learning forward. Now let's listen in to see what unfolds. And this one? Spy. So what's that? Face. Again? Face. Spay. 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 Say it again. Face. Spay. Okay, so what's this? Mm -hmm. 
כן? אולי. And this one? Mice. That's good. Again? Mice. This one? Fice. Oh, so these two are good. And what's this one? Spy. Yeah, yeah you ch you're changing it. Yeah. Mice. Spy. This one? Lice. That's it. Again? Lice. Fice. Mice. Spy. No? Spike. So it's the same with all these three or four words. What's the same? Ice. That's right. So what's this? Spike. Ah. Spike. Sorry? Spike. Spike. Okay, let's go, let's go to this one. So what's this word? Spike. That's good. Again. Spike. Mice. Spice, lice, spice. Ah. ah, you got it. Again. Spice. Sorry. Spice. No. Spice, spice. Again. Spice, spice, lice, mice, spice. Lost it. Lost because s. That's right. And if I. If I want to correct S, maybe I will read off that one. So this is good, again. Spice. It's good, no problem. What's the last sound? Ice. That's right. Spice. Ah. Spice. Okay. So, um, you can see from this example that um, um, what are you saying? So, any comments you'd like to make about it? Closer to the mic. How's that? I'm now eating the mic. Yes, and then. Mm. Breakfast, hey? <laughs> That's right. Missed out on breakfast. Yeah. So what that um, does for me, it confirms the fact that students for themselves can work out uh, what they need to. You know, repetition, imitation, um, is something that um, can help some people, but it doesn't necessarily get to the heart of what the problem is and the problem is that they they don't hear correct please it's what they think they say so there are all these levels of listening listening to somebody else listening to yourself listen to yourself as others would hear you so there are these listenings that we have to become much more attentive to and the process of repetition or imita more particularly imitation and that's a lot of the time drilling pronunciation work the students is drilling them it doesn't help them get back to the to the essences to the essence of what's required in fixing one's pronunciation at that level the essence is you have to listen to yourself incredibly carefully incredibly carefully so how is it that we can encourage somebody to look at themselves and start to improve their listening? Without improving their listening, there is no uh, way the pronunciation is going to improve. Some people sort of fall into good pronunciation because the listening is very good, but a lot of people have got actually very poor listening habits, listening skills, and they have to improve them. And the improving them can only come from them understanding that they have to be more attentive to their own listening. And that's how you improve. You become more attentive. A bit like that story, you pay more attention. You pay more attention. You pay more attention. And finally you see it. And she was the same. She paid attention. She paid more attention. Um, and that is has to come from inside. They have to want to do this. If they don't want to do this, and this is what comes from engagement, there's nothing that we can do that's going to help them. So part of that process that, that as a learn as a teacher that I engage them 
is to have them want to participate, have them engage, have them um, really drive themselves to understand better, understand more, listen more carefully. All of these things are very personal responses. As a teacher, I can't insist they do. It comes from them as individuals. Okay, so at this point, I think I will stop. And if anybody wants to like to ask me some questions, I'll be happy to answer as best as I can in this environment. Yeah, Mariana, engage is listening, yeah. It's more than listening, though, and, and it's try is, is getting to it. But it's an inner, you know for yourself, for example, the, the good exam, another good example of engagement is when a student or you, you may yourself play a game. When you play, for example, a computer game or Monopoly or some kind of game, you're involved. Your emotions are involved, you're attentive, you're, you know, there's a whole different quality. And people can't drag us away. No one can drag them away. They just, I want to do this, I want to figure it out, I want to do it. And that's, that's the quality of engagement that we're looking for. So I want to encourage the students. And that's what, as a learner, once we get that quality of engagement, nothing can stop us. Nothing. PPP, person to person. You can have person to many people. P P to MP. How's that? P to MP. Person to many person. I was hitting a P Y S pattern. Eh? What's what's a P Y P? It doesn't just matter that much. Um, yeah, P Y P. Thank you. <laughs> Audio is disappearing. Okay, I started have breakfast again. Prep your program. Okay, so sometimes, and I think this is common to many different teaching environments, we're asked to um, pursue a curriculum. We're asked to do something as per the way the school wants us to do it. And I've been in that in situation. And, um, you know, sometimes um, there is an issue there. I mean, I'll, I'll not step away from that. But I've also found that sometimes it's as a teacher learn to play at the edges. So you, to start off with, I would suggest not jump in and change everything, but start to play at the edges and try to do one one thing a day or or one or one or two things a day in this lesson that a little bit that you think are engaging. So you start to experiment and start to see how you can do something differently, even with a traditional text. There are things that sometimes Sometimes you can do, which are which are very in fact very different. I mean, if I showed you how I'd work with text, um, you know, it's very different, I suspect, to what um, how it's recommended in many of the textbooks and what sorts of things they do. Um, but you can certainly, like I said, start off slow, start off small, and see if you can start to build your own confidence and your own skill and expertise. And as you build it. You can slowly expand it. How's that? The webs on the website. Um, there, on the website, actually, there's quite a number of articles about grammar, about um, talking about the website. I'll go to the next slide because it gives me the contact details. Um, so on the website, you'll find lots of different articles about different coming coming to the same problem from different perspectives whether it's spelling or whether it's listening or whether it's teaching grammar or vocabulary or memory skills um, you will see many different posts and articles sometimes video casts, sometimes podcasts about looking at the same problem i've um worked at this site for a few years now the first one strategies in language learning and so it's it's got a reasonable collection of articles now. Thanks, Mohammed. Thank you so much, so, uh, Andrew. We can't. Yeah, see yeah. More, questions, but are there any questions? We've yes, I've Nelly. extended the time. Uh, please um, 
add your questions or comments uh, that you'd like Andrew to um, refer to. There's a question here by Soma. Do you have some of that on your website? How to work with the text differently? So we're talking about text uh, and ideas and how to work with it differently. Andrew? Yeah, I'm not, I mean, there's, there's text and text. Are we talking about long text or short text or um, writing skills, reading skills? Um, text is a very large, to me, a very large area of, of language. But as I said before, on the website, there are um, posts, articles about teaching of language, of, of, uh, of um, writing and reading. You know, Andrew. Um, or grammar, vocabulary. Yeah. yeah. So all of those things. Yes. Yeah, I'm. I'm finding that. I'm listening. Yeah, that I don't know how you feel about this, but I find that if we kind of, you know, think about our attitude and how we feel about, you know, language learning, not specifically language teaching, I think that we could probably come up with great ideas as teachers or you know, on, on how to work with the content, the text, or whatever we have. I think, I think it starts really with, um, you know, with how we approach um, learning. And maybe, you know, how we approach, like you said, our first language and what we think about learning a language. So I think that we would be a lot smarter if we could kind of tap into, because I think, we all have a lot more than we realize. And, you know, some, some teachers are just looking out there for, you know, help, help, I need help. Um, you know, and, and instead of looking inside and, and, and seeing if they could come up with, um, you know, with their unique way of reaching their specific students, like you did with your student from um, Vietnam. I mean, I don't think that that, that may not apply to other learners but it certainly worked with her. Mm. <clears throat> well, I, I agree with you nearly wholeheartedly. I mean, I, I as, a, as a language teacher, I, send it, I set out and I've actually learned, not the proficiency, but I'm, I must have taken on about 10 different all Chinese, Vietnamese, Turkish, Spanish, French, I don't know whatever the other language is. Um, um, basically to get a better understanding how I learn and um, the, the, the critical thing as a teacher I believe and I agree with you completely is to get a better understanding of what happens with me everybody but I'm human and we're all human and there are commonalities and I think that what I've shown here is that all of us learned our first language and there is, we're all the same in that way. So there's no differences. The differences can do occur as we get older and there are differences, slight differences in learning. With, I agree with that entirely. But qualities like perception, awareness, attention, they're human qualities. And that's, the, that's what I'm on about completely. So on the website that I have there the, at the top of this page, that site actually all the posts I've written is fundamentally for language learners. Um, and so I have a lot of language teachers registered on the site who, who write to me. Um, because by coming in and learning, a teacher can make sense of it for themselves and take out what they need to. For language learners, that's, I agree with you completely, that's where it all starts. How do people learn? And once we understand that better, we can understand more, more about um, what actually is required. I saw a, one of the comments here before that somebody said I'm a lousy language learner. Well, the thing to understand is that when you first started, whoever said that, you weren't a lousy language learner. You, you learned the language really well, your first language. The problem is that I've said this, I've said this in a number of different venues, is that if someone teaches you how to eat soup with a fork, you're going to fail. <laughs> you're not going to do it. You're just going to be a miserable failure at drinking or eating soup. So 
that's what happens, I believe, in learning language in the fork to learn languages with. And the fork will not work. It just won't. For some, somehow they work it out that they put a spoon under the fork and it works. But basically, we have to find the spoon. In language learning, that's the key that we need. We need to find the spoon in learning languages. What actually works? All of us have the capacity to learn languages. I have no, I'm 100% convinced about that. There is not one shred of doubt in my mind about that. The problem is that we get disempowered, disenfranchised about what we do, and all of a sudden the whole thing sounds, looks, oh my God, it's impossible. If things are impossible, drinking soup with a fork is impossible. Change it, and you'll find that it becomes possible. Everyone can do it. There's, there's no doubt. I'm 100% I'm sure about it. So, or if you believe you can't do it, just go out and change your mind. Find something that enables we can see that you can do it. You'll be an excellent teacher. Yeah, good on you. Some of you. Anything else? Any comments or questions? I may have missed while I've been speaking. Need to be written. Um, so revamped when we start early with the kids, doing it the right way. Yeah, I've taught at university programs um, for a number of years, helping masters and PhD students. Um, yeah, uh, look, I agree. It's not straightforward at that level because they're under a lot of pressure to perform. Um, but even with those, I, I work with them. I mean, some of the time we worked in the way they needed to work, and some of the time I, I led them I, I show them that there is another way of working, and um, because really, to master an air, master language, however you come to it, ultimately, you've got to get to the point that you have to get engaged in the process. And if you can't get to that point, and you think I'm going to learn language by learning more grammar, by studying more rules, by studying this, by studying that, you'll never get there. Whether you're at university and you've got to a certain level, and a lot of them get stuck, or whether you're at a beginner level. The issue is exactly the same. If you don't get to the point of moving on, understanding that you are the driver and not the book, not the teacher, you are the driver and you have to be the driver, then the, you're going to get stuck at some point. And that's what happens with most language learners. They get stuck and just can't progress because they haven't mastered what it is they need to do when they're being the driver. They don't know where the gears are. They don't know where the pedal is. They just doing something, but they haven't figured out how to do it. So as a teacher, as a, as a language learning coach, my job is to help them rediscover the, the, the steering wheel, the clutch, the gears, and so forth. That's right, I agree. I do not believe in ability. Andrew, those are great examples. I think I think we'll never forget the fork and spoon example. The fork example is amazing. Uh, talk about stories. Here's an example of modeling storytelling. Yeah, that's a really nice, very short <laughs> and to the point. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, that was excellent. Oh. Thank you, Andrew. You had quite a turn up, even though it's the end of post. Uh, I've never done a post before. We've been doing this for five years, and we have never done a post. Oh, that, that wasn't the thumbs down. I don't know how that happened. No, no, no. That was all hands up. Um, so I don't know um, how it happened, but I'm glad it did, Andrew. And you know what? This post... Uh, conference ideas is a very good one for all those, you know, where they're, they had technical problems and so on, weather problems, whatever, to have a post conference, you know, and you can do this online, you can't do this face to face. So, so I'm glad it happened, you know, because I'm gonna do this next year, too, <laughs> in case somebody, uh, misses things so thank you thank you so much and by the way everything is ready for 2015 um andrew and others who want to present uh and the book chapter of course for 2014 everything is in exactly where um if you could go into that andrew into the uh, 
the CO14 conference area that uh, Tom has just added. Just go in there and you'll get all the information for 2015 and for the book chapter for uh, 2014. For those who don't know, uh, we're trying to publish a book a year. There's 2012 and we're in the process of publishing 2013. So thank you, everyone. Uh, come closer to the mic because we don't hear you. Thank you very much, folks, for listening and being attentive and asking those great questions, making comments, and thanks very much, Nelly, for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for allowing us to come into your home in Australia. That's the exciting part, yeah. coming into people's homes like this. So, thank you so much. Just from a bookshelf at the back. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it looks very, it almost looks like mine, but you've got more books, I think. Right. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All the best. Vissant Latash. Vissant Latash. <laughs>